absolutely a pleasure to be here. And uh, what's that? I was going to say, don't, yeah, don't start the heckling yet, please, Wayne. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and, you know, wander around campus on this beautiful day for the past six years, so I feel like I have a fairly good feel for the campus and the students. Um, let's see, how do I put the lights? That's not the, obviously, I don't know how to do that. Is that too dark? <laughs> Thanks, Wayne. Um, so what I'd like to do uh, today is talk about uh, a few, give you an overview of a few different projects that, that I'm working on uh, in a collaborative capacity with a number of colleagues, and I want to emphasize that right up front. Um, this is all we, um, colleagues here in the United States, colleagues in, in uh, Chile. But before I get into the, the particulars of the research that I'm doing, I wanted to talk for a few minutes and to give you a context for why uh, I've spent probably more than I should of my life thinking about islands and island species and, and their conservation. And why islands and island systems are disproportionately vulnerable. To do that though, we need to recognize that islands are not, uh, not all islands are created equal. So we can break islands into two broad categories. Continental islands, which are those that uh, are on continental plates. They have had indirect or direct connection with continental land masses historically, even if not currently. That's in <coughs> contrast to oceanic islands. Oceanic islands are generally volcanic in origin. They have never had any sort of connection to a continental land mass. They tend to be more remote, more isolated. And this is important when we start to think about the characteristics of these islands from a biodiversity perspective. If we look at oceanic islands, they have extremely high levels of endemism. And some islands, including one of the island groups that I work on in Chile, have, have the highest levels of endemism per unit area in the world. Endemism meaning species unique to that area. So these islands are disproportionately important because they have large numbers of species that are found nowhere else on the planet. If we look at islands from a, a global perspective, we see that Islands actually only comprise about 3% of the, the land area of Earth. We can then take a step back and say, okay, so they're very small percentage of the land mass, but where do we, what do we see when we overlay the status of threatened and endangered species? And we actually have pretty good records for some taxonomic groups of the levels of extinction um, over the last 400 years, so kind of historic records from the early 1600s. During this window of time, the last 400 uh, plus years, nearly 50% of extinctions, documented extinctions, have been of island species. So you place that 50%, you compare that, that that 50% extinction rate is happening on less than 3% of the land mass of the Earth. And this is why we're concerned about the status of islands globally and, and the biodiversity that inhabits them. If we look at islands, we can think of islands as uh, hotspots for threatened endemic species. So 20% of threatened amphibians are endemic to islands, 25% of threatened mammals, and about a third of threatened bird species. Within the birds, 88% of documented extinctions have occurred on islands, and the primary driver of those extinctions has been biological invasives, uh, invasions. So invasive species, exotic species that are brought in by humans, either intentionally or inadvertently, and they consequently can have tremendous impacts, as you'll see in some of the subsequent work. So just a few examples, Hamilton's frog, critically endangered frog um, from the most primitive group of extant frogs on the planet, endemic to New Zealand, a lemur from Madagascar, also critically endangered, and one of the Hawaiian honey creepers, um, also an endangered species. All island endemics, um, and endemic to island groups or families, in some cases. So if we look then at the principal causes of extinctions, from anthropogenic causes at least, obviously extinction is a natural process, human predation, um, and direct exploitation of species is a contributing factor. Exotic species, so those are introduced in invasives. Habitat loss, and then the spread of disease. And I'm not going to touch on all of these in my comments, but you'll see that several of these will occur repeatedly, so they're kind of recurrent themes um, 
not just on the islands where we're working, but again, uh, on a global level. So it's that is a very brief background to why I would argue that conservation of islands, island species, island systems is, uh, does have global conservation significance. Um, here's where I want to take you today with, with the talk. I want to provide you with a quick overview of aspects of a long-term conservation research program that I've been directing in the Juan Fernandez Islands, Chile, uh, and talk about a few species that we're working with there. And then follow that up with an overview of how we're using seabird ecology here in Washington State to help inform conservation and management decisions. And then the third point, marine debris, is a project that we've uh, just recently embarking on with uh, collaborating with the Slater Museum here. And I just want to give you a sense of where we envision that going. We're, we're um, kind of at the early stages of, of that project. So starting with the Juan Fernandez Islands. Uh, they are a Chilean national park. In fact, they're the first national park declared in Chile about 75 years ago. They're also a UNESCO International Biosphere Reserve. So there's both national and international recognition of the biological significance of these islands. Uh, it's also been, these islands, which are comprised of three main islands, uh, are considered to be one of the 12 most threatened national parks in the world. So globally significant, high levels of endemism, and yet under significant threat. And that's really what drew, drew our attention to the islands initially. Just to give you, um, to place you geographically, here's that long skinny string bean of a country, Chile. Off central Chile, that's about the same latitude as Valparaiso or Santiago. Um, 700 kilometers offshore is the archipelago, and it's comprised of, of these three islands. And you know, this isn't a scale. Selkirk is actually 150 kilometers to the west. So these are not in the southern fjord islands um, that we tend to think of when we, we think of Chile, but they are oceanic islands, volcanic in origin, never been connected to the continent. If we look at endemism, to give you a sense again of why we've invested a number of years, we've been working down there for 11 years now, um, it, it comes down to endemism, and things that we lose there are irreplaceable globally. Nearly two-thirds of all native plant species are endemic, over half of, and recognize that that's a pretty depauperate avifauna. Um, the, uh, these islands are remote, they're hard to get to, not just for us, but for anything that's trying to colonize them. And so we only have 15 native bird species, um, but 53% of those are endemic, and seven of those are single island endemics, meaning that the entire global population occurs on a single island. Um, and remarkably little work has actually been done on these islands despite their international recognition. So we don't actually really have a sense of how many endemic insects um, and marine species are present in the archipelago. So threats are numerous. Historic habitat loss, 400 years ago this would have been uh, cloud forest, 100%. It's now eroded down to mineral soil. Um, so logging, clearing of forests, introduction of pasture for cattle. Cattle continue to be to continue to have an impact um, on a variety of species and systems in the archipelago. Introduce rodents, so rats and mice, feral goats. It's it's quite an impressive laundry list. These are invasive plant species. European rabbits, which are not only native to, not, not native to these <coughs> islands, but they were introduced to Chile. They're not native to Chile either or South America. They're European in origin. They were secondarily introduced out to Juan Fernandez. And then everybody's favorite devastating <laughs> island invasive, <coughs> feral cats. Um, and these are, you know, think about these threats as not acting in isolation, that they, they have synergistic effects. So these may not be preying on something, but they may create, they may be altering habitat, which degrades the habitat for that species while feral cats are exerting a pressure or invasive plants are altering habitat structure and creating conditions less favorable for a species and therefore predation by something is having a disproportionate impact. So they're, they're interactive. Well, we've approached conservation in an, in an integrated way, and this is certainly not a, a novel or visionary approach, but I wanted to give you a sense for the way that we have kind of intentionally gone about trying to put 
conservation into practice in Juan Fernandez. And the Juan Fernandez Islands Conservancy is a conservation NGO that I co-founded years ago. It's now affiliated with Waikono's Ecosystem Knowledge, which is, um, which is an, a conservation NGO that some colleagues founded. So we're now a program of, of Oikonos. And you know, as a trained research scientist, you know, we start, and <coughs> our group started with research, recognizing that we need to have good quantitative data to help inform real conservation decisions. Restoration is also a critical part of many conservation initiatives. So we include that in, in our, our metric. The community, actively involving the community, bringing them in, informing, educating, building capacity in the community. Um, because, again, if you don't create something lasting in the community, as soon as you pull out, as soon as your funds end, there's the end of your conservation initiative. So if you really want to have something lasting in place, you need to have the community buy in, support, and actively engage. And then the fourth component is, is policy. All of these interact to help us put conservation into practice. And I also want to mention, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, that it's not just bees acting in isolation and contributing to conservation, but they also interact and inform one another. For example, our research findings help inform our restoration priorities and activities. Research is shared with and transmitted to the community, and we have and hire local islanders to work with us in participating in the research. Research is used to inform policy, national conservation strategies, management plans by the park. Community participates actively in restoration, and again, if the restoration is to take, if it's to be effective, the community needs to appreciate that and buy into it if they're not actively involved in that process. The restoration also interacts with policy, and not surprisingly, the last arrow, community and policy. Um, so we see these things as interacting, and you can't really pull one out, or you really weaken the structure um, that is necessary for lasting conservation. So, in terms of the research that we've, we're doing, I want to just give you a sense of the large-scale approaches we're taking. For many of these uh, bird species that we focus most of our attention on, there has been very little done on basic population biology. In fact, something as simple as approximate or quantitative population estimates were lacking for the, the vast majority of species, let alone things more sophisticated as understanding ecology, critical habitat, and so forth. So we're, we're for many of these species, starting virtually from scratch. In quantifying impacts of invasives. Now, in many respects, we already know enough to say that, you know, where there are feral cats on islands, they're going to cause a problem. That's nothing novel. But coming to the community and actually being able to show them, look, this is what feral cats are doing in these colonies, and giving them firsthand experience from their place, or asking them to do the observations, brings it home, and it helps the community then value something that might be controversial otherwise, like the elimination of cats. So invasive species, we're quantifying predation, competition with native species, and also impacts of habitat also alteration. Habitat use patterns. If you really want to talk effectively about conserving a species, you need to understand what critical habitat is involved. <coughs> what are their fundamental habitat requirements? And do those change over the course of years or over, over uh, many years? And then if we're undertaking habitat restoration or conservation actions, we also want to measure a follow-up. So how, if at all, do these species respond to these actions that you've undertaken? If they don't respond, you want to know that because that's not a good use of your resources if you keep beating your head against a wall to no, to no avail. The species that we're working on, I just broke down uh, into two groups. The land birds, which are in the upper right. The fire crown is the top one, the Masafuera rayadito. Both species are critically endangered. Um, they're endemic. They're both single island endemics. And then the threatened seabird community are these birds along the bottom. Think of it as Shearwater, Petrel, Juan Fernandez Petrel, Steiniger's Petrel, and Kermadec Petrel. 
For the purposes of today's talk, I'm not going to have time to talk about to discuss all of the, the work that we're doing with these species. So I'm going to focus on these three highlighted ones. The fire crown, the upper right, which is a hummingbird, and then these two species of seabirds. And just give you a sense of the sorts of work that we're, we're doing and how we're trying to take the research and put it into a broader conservation practice through in, informing management, policy, and restoration. So the fire crown, again, it's critically endangered. It's a single island endemic. It's actually the only island endemic hummingbird in the world. Um, spectacular birds, really remarkable. To give you a sense of some of the natural history that's relevant in the context of some of the work we're doing, I just put up a few points up here. Uh, they're habitat specialists and really depend, at least in parts of their, their annual life cycle, on native forest. They forage on both endemic and introduced plant species. They seem to be highly vulnerable to habitat alteration by invasive plants, and they also suffer significantly um, from predation by feral cats. So a very quick and dirty overview of uh, some salient aspects of their natural history. Well, one of the early things that we did was begin to quantify and characterize breeding habitat. We know roughly what they, where they were, but what factors kind of drove that? What were the explanatory mechanisms? What were they cueing on? Um, and so this is work that my colleague, Dr. Aaron Hagen, who is now with Island Conservation, um, led. In fact, a lot of this comprised her uh, PhD dissertation. We worked collabor collaboratively on it. And we took the approach of looking at what people had hypothesized biologically as explanations for why fire crowns were dependent on these native forests. I mean, what would explain the presence or absence of nests? So there were three models out there. Native forest, and presumably there's a native aso uh, or a positive association with components or parameters of native forest that the birds were queuing on. Native food trees, so recognizing that hummingbirds are primarily nectarivorous, they consume nectar, secondarily insects, so one might predict that the presence of potential food resources in the immediate surroundings of a, a possible nest site could be important, um, and invasive plants, and the prediction was there that if there was any association, it would be negative. The response variable we used was nest presence, we applied a multiple logistic regression, and the best model by far was the one that included presence of invasives. So we took this, and we also then looked at what our empirical data were saying. So where, where were we seeing these uh, nests? Where were we not? And relating it to presence of invasives. And this is the pattern that, we've, that we have found. Nest sites had virtually no invasive species Within, our, within the plots surrounding each nest tree as compared with non-nests. So these are sites that otherwise were comparable, but they had higher, they had higher percentages of invasive plants um, in the immediate surroundings. That gives us further support for the idea that these birds, for some reason, are queuing on areas that were relatively clean, had virtually no to no invasive plants around the nest. And we took that then and said, right, given that, Maybe we should, if we're going to undertake conservation or restoration actions, we should focus it on controlling invasive plants in this otherwise high quality habitat. And if we remove them, maybe the birds will actually utilize it. And so we applied that and we trained and contracted a team of field technicians. These are all island residents um, who have worked with us for a number of years. Now this is now the eighth year of invasive plant control. We focused on, oh this is, sorry, this is a photo of a before, and then a week later, that's the exact same perspective. That's what it looks like after we remove the invasives from the area. I say we, I didn't actually remove a single plant. It was, <laughs> it was all of them that did the grunt work. Um, so we are focused this on the, the part of the island that has the highest density of fire crown nests because we concurrently do annual breeding season monitoring and find all of the nests that we can in these, these areas that we consider to be critical habitat. And we're working in about 45% of that, that sector. And we're trying to maintain that and gradually expand it over time. As part of it, we do annual monitoring 
So we monitor native plant regeneration and also invasive plant regeneration. The, the challenge with invasive plant control is you're not done after you've, got, you've gotten rid of the mature plants because there's a seed bank and things will continue to regenerate for many years. And so we systematically go back to every controlled area every year, document, and then we do a secondary cleaning so that the native plants have a chance to get a foothold or a root hold and grow up um, in the absence of invasives. What we have seen encouragingly in all of the areas that we've controlled is very strong native plant regeneration. And in some areas, within three years, you would have absolutely no idea that that area had ever been dominated by invasive blackberry or this invasive tree species that's native to mainland Chile. Our main, and, and that's certainly important because these forests themselves are highly degraded and highly fragmented and threatened. So that alone is worthy because we're helping to stabilize a gradually degrading ecosystem. But from a fire crown perspective, what was really encouraging is that we have found that in 50% of the controlled areas, there's a nesting attempt by breeding fire crowns the next breeding season. And if we look two years out, it's three quarters of those sites have been reoccupied or recolonized. And so effectively by doing this, we are pushing back slowly and certainly not at a sufficiently large scale to be really satisfying, but we're stabilizing this area and gradually improving it for fire plants, this critically endangered species. As part of this work, um, and Prito Picaflor is the local name. Picaflor is uh, Spanish for, for hummingbird. Um, we have two island coordinators who started, this is Paula and this is Cristian. They started working with us as technicians about seven to eight years ago. They've gradually taken on more responsibilities and they're now working as full-time coordinators and leading our everyday efforts um, on these projects that I have listed here. I'm not going to go into detail, but suffice to say that this is pretty impressive that these people who had, had no professional training prior to this are now leading teams looking at flowering phenology. They are doing breeding season monitoring with our supervision, but they're the on-the-ground implementers and coordinators. It's been a very successful model um, and really inspiring to see them taking on increasing responsibilities. Moving on to the pink-footed shearwater, which is a seabird. Um, these birds come back to land only to breed. It's vulnerable. It's a Chilean endemic. It breeds in the Juan Fernandez Islands and one other island, um, which is a continental island. A quick overview of their natural history. They're a colonial burrow nester. They're a long-distant migrant. They're very long-lived. And these are will come back in, in, these are all relevant to the points I'm gonna make in a moment. Very low reproductive rates. And their diet is largely fish and squid. So here's a burrow, a marked burrow that we use as one, in one of our study plots. In one of the stories I want to share briefly is that of impacts of introduced mammals. So earlier I said that introduced mammals can have various impacts. They can have predation, they can have competition. In the case of pinkfoots, they suffer from both. Here we have a pinkfooted shearwater outside of a breeding burrow killed by a feral cat. These are the major colonies, so the largest four colonies on the main island of Robinson Crusoe. And then Santa Clara is another island. This is effectively our control because there are no mammals on Santa Clara. And you see zero, zero percent adult predation. In fact, of 10 years of monitoring the island, we've never found a dead adult on the island. They die, obviously, they're not immortal. But <laughs> when seabirds are ill, they don't come back to the colony. They tend to stay at sea and die at sea. When we look at these numbers and we say, well, 1%, 3%, 4%, that's really low. That shouldn't be a problem. But these are extremely case-selected species. And that means that they have high adult survival, very low reproductive rates, deferred reproductive maturity, and they are disproportionately sensitive to any increases in adult mortality. And so some modeling has been done by some other colleagues working on similar species that has found that an otherwise stable population that incurs an increase of even 2 to 3 percent in adult mortality can decline. It can destabilize the population. So right here on some of these, these, these colonies, we're right on the cusp of that, even though at first glance it doesn't look like it's all that significant. 
competition, introduced rabbits. Um, well, we were fortunate in terms of our time, and we actually started working in the islands two years before a rabbit eradication uh, was carried out on the island of Santa Clara. So rabbits were eliminated, and we had two years of data on breeding biology, a variety of reproductive parameters, prior to the eradication, and then following. So here we have, by year, percentage of burrow occupancy. So this is the percentage of burrows that had actively breeding pairs in them. Um, and three different colonies that we were monitoring. Those were the three orange dots. The orange line here indicates the rabbit eradication. So we have two seasons prior, and then we now have two, four, seven or eight seasons following. And there are some unusual things which I want to explain. Those two, um, this colony here, Haifuhio, was actually right beside the hunter's huts. And so those were effectively rabbit-free before the formal eradication took place. Because the hunters would be around at the end of the day, if they saw a rabbit from the hut, they would blast it into its next incarnation. And so there were no rabbits in that colony for several years. And so what we were effectively seeing here is a rabbit-free occupancy rate. The other thing that's kind of, it was worrying for us initially was, so what we see overall is a 40% increase in, in breeding pairs on the island subsequent to the eradication. This, what had happened, we, the first year we thought, wow, that's a quick response, that looks great. The next year we thought, oh my gosh, what's going on? This makes no sense to us. Fortunately, we had, Dave, we were doing concurrent research on two other species, of <laughs> seabirds that breed in Juan Fernandez. They showed a similar decline in breeding effort that year. And then we, that led us to look at larger causal factors, oceanographic factors, and it turns out that that year was a radically different year oceanographically. There was a decreased uh, level of primary productivity in the zones where these birds forage, and that made us feel a little bit more common that this was just, you know, this was an interesting ecological blip, but it doesn't actually have anything to do with the overall trend, which you can see looks like it's probably plateaued out at about 70% occupancy instead of 35 to 40%. This is a student um, that, not a UPS student, but an undergraduate, um, who's now a graduate student at um, Oregon State, Amanda Gladich. And we worked together on a project in which we uh, wanted to quantify the impacts of cattle in breeding colonies of pink-footed shearwaters. There's one colony on the island that still, that cattle still had access to. And remember, this is National Park. Uh, there's Amanda looking at, at burrows that were collapsed by um, burrow entrances and burrows that were collapsed by cattle. And we have four study sites. This is the, com the only one of the four that had cattle. The other three historically did, but no longer do. And this is the percentage of burrows with damage. Highly significant difference. Um, that colony is getting hammered by cattle walking through, and just through their mass, collapsing burrows. Whoops, we also looked at whether that was equally vulnerable across the colony and what we found is actually, no, it wasn't. So red, again, represents the Piedra colony. And we saw that up on the ridge top, where the slope is least and the burrow is shallowest, that was where we saw the greatest percentage of damaged burrows. We were able to take these data, go to the National Park, and say, we'd like to propose to build an exclusionary fence so that we exclude cattle from this area, working with the Cattlemen's Association. And we all came to agreement on that. And we were able to build the fence. These are some islanders, again, that we contracted. This was just completed a few months ago. So now cattle are excluded from the second largest colony on the island. Um, and we're also now talking with the park about using this, that protected area as an opportunity to begin to reintroduce native plants. Because this, all of what you see in the foreground is non-native plants. If you remove cattle, they're not going to be able to graze on it, and you have a reasonable expectation that replanting is going to be successful as a, as a race restoration. And one last thing I want to mention with the, the pinkfoots quickly, we've also been doing satellite tracking. Here's a pinkfooted shearwater with a, a, uh, a um, solar-powered satellite tag. Deploying them on the birds to better understand marine habitat use patterns and migratory routes. 
And we've asked two questions, one, what, or two general questions, and two general spatial scales. One is during the breeding season, so where are the birds going? What zones are they using during the breeding season when they're provisioning chicks? Um, with the idea that for a lot of these seabird species, interactions with fisheries or, is a potential impact. In order for that to be true, you obviously have to have spatial overlap. So that's the first level of questioning. So here we have the birds were tagged here. Each of these dots represents a satellite location. You can kind of infer routes. And the colors, think of this as a heat map. The more intense colors represent the more intensively used zones. So what these birds are generally doing, this is for, these data are from 2004. This is a, uh, true for multiple years. They generally made a beeline for the coast of Chile over the, the shelf and shelf break and concentrated here north of Concepcion and Talcahuano. So that's that red is the bullseye. That's really the hot spot for them. If we then look at why, you can look at regional primary productivity with the more intense colors, the warmer colors meaning more productive, using mean chlorophyll concentration as a proxy for productivity. So the red, if you just informally overlay where the, the shearwaters are going, not surprisingly, they're hitting these highly productive areas because where you get high primary productivity, you tend to get high levels of predator biomass. And so forage fish, squid are very abundant there. Also not surprisingly is that it also attracts commercial fisheries. And that is the most intensively fished region in all of Chile. So now we understand where the birds are going. We know where the fisheries are. And we're working with the federal government and the fisheries agencies down there to get observers on board boats to document whether or not there's actual bycatch of the species in these fisheries so that we can understand whether that potential impact is an actual threat to the species. In terms of the, the migration uh, tracking, we also, as given that this species is highly migratory, uh, we see non-breeding pink-footed shearwaters off the coast of Washington every summer that are breeding a few months later down in Chile. If we seriously want to talk about conserving species that have that migrate on that magnitude, you really need to think about work not just on the colonies, which helps, it's essential, not just in their breeding ground, the foraging grounds during the breeding season, but also where they move throughout their annual cycle. So we tag birds and we've tracked them up and down the coast. Um, and this map, again, is a, think of it as a heat map. The hotter colors are the areas that are disproportionately important. Here's that foraging zone in Chile. One of the things that we discovered through this uh, study was we knew birds passed through Peru, and Peru is obviously well known for its highly productive water. <coughs> we didn't realize, and nobody knew this previously, that Peru is actually an important wintering ground for the species. We had previously assumed that virtually all of them moved up into North American waters, and that's not true. Over half of the birds we tagged stayed in Peru and then moved back down. That gave us insights again. Peru has intensive fisheries, um, and a lot of species have been documented as bycatch. It helps direct our efforts, and we're working with people in Peru to try to gain better information about whether or not there's significant bycatch of shearwaters in that fishery. So there's the wintering, the wintering zone up in the California Current System, where some birds go. There's that migratory route that they move generally move rapidly through and then they have their breeding region. And we need to integrate across all of those and think on an international level for species such as this if we realistically want to talk about effective conservation. The research that we have, that we've produced, has also been used to drive a bunch of actual on-the-ground conservation plans. So the CEC, the Commission for Environmental Conservation, is the environmental arm of NAFTA, and they have been producing a series of North American conservation action plans. We contributed data and co-wrote that. Chile has a national plan of conservation for the pink-footed shearwater. Um, I'm a co-author on that, and a lot of our data <coughs> informed the um, research priorities and kind of conservation objectives and priorities for the species. And Canada also has uh, a recovery strategy for, this is a joint strategy that 
that I contributed to. And so we're taking the research, we're trying to do on the ground conservation, and we're also trying to extend it as far as we can by bringing it into the policy arena and having it incorporated in these plans that have you know, national consequences for the birds. Very, very quickly, um, Dephilippi's petrel is a, a species that is, uh, has kind of fallen through the cracks. It's officially listed as vulnerable by the IUCN. It's a Chilean endemic, present in only two island groups. That's a, it, up on the upper right. This is a former student from here, Emily Landex. She did her senior thesis with me a couple of summers ago, um, in which we conducted the first empirical population estimates so that we could actually come up with a more realistic conservation assess or ass assessment of the conservation status. Prior to this work, there had been no empirical population estimate. People had come up with an estimate based on the size of the islands, but no one had actually gone out and done surveys. We, the results of our work is that in the Juan Fernandez, we estimate less than 500 breeding pairs. Globally, we estimate less than 1,000, which is less than 10% of the previous estimate. So with this information, we're now in the process of preparing for BirdLife International and the IUCN a petition to uplist uh, the species or reclassify it to endangered. Um, and that would then kick off a, a, a string of actions and at the very least increase visibility, bring attention and resources to trying to make sure that, we, that this species is stable and, and we don't lose it through lack of, of awareness. We also do a tremendous amount with community, the community. I mentioned the work where we have, we've trained and uh, continue to work closely with, with, they're now professionals, field technicians, we have our island coordinators, but we also do a lot, we do a lot more than that. So we have the, the field technicians, we uh, continue to develop and, and fund and lead environmental education program for children. There's a community shearwater reserve that we've just had established at the national level, which we use for educational purposes. In the upper right, that's Christian with an infrared camera probe. Um, we regularly take children out there uh, to show them the shearwaters in their burrows in a non-invasive way. We create volunteer opportunities so people from town that are interested can participate in invasive plant control. They can go through training programs and participate as uh, volunteers on bird surveys. There's a cat control program that, uh, that we're involved with. And just recently, we officially had established a community conservation group. Um, <coughs> and that, again, the whole idea here is to get, student, uh, get residents in the islands, inform them, get them excited, give them opportunities to participate in the hope that that's how they're going to value these resources that they have, many of which are unique to their islands. So switching gears. <coughs> to Seabird Ecology in Washington Islands. Remarkably, and this was surprising to me when I moved up here about seven years ago, um, we, we know remarkably little about most of the seabird species that breed and inhabit Washington waters. Um, some we know well, but overall our, our knowledge is surprisingly thin. And not just the ecology, but also the status. So this is work that I've been doing with a colleague, Scott Pearson, at Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and a colleague, Tom Good, up at NOAA, um, Northwest Fishery Science Center. And for a, couple, for a few focal species, one of which is the, the tufted puffin, um, trying to get a better handle on population dynamics, so status and trends of populations in Washington. We're also using seabirds as tools, as indicators really, of oceanographic conditions and trying to cast a retrospective look back to see if conditions have actually changed um, over the past 30 or 40 years using some historical data. And then we're also working very closely with uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service and their National Wildlife Refuge, the Washington Maritime Islands Complex, on questions related to management and conservation of islands that, that they're in charge of managing. For today, though, I'm just going to focus on the, the focal species of the rhinoceros auklet. Um, this is a widespread Washington breeder. It's also a colonial uh, burrow nester, and it's highly piscivorous. You can see the upper right. There's a there's a rhinoceros auklet with a uh, with an impressive bill full of sand lance. Um, colleagues and 
is Emma Kelsey, who worked with us for a couple of seasons on these projects, um, a former, or she's a UPS alum now, and in grad school at San Jose State. Our study sites, we have three, and you know, we have the ominously named Destruction Island, then we have the much gentler sounding Protection Island. Both of those are islands within the National Wildlife Refuge. And that up, up on the, on the uh, tip of Cape Flattery is Tatoosh Island, which is actually owned by the Macaw um, Indian Nation. And we have permission to work out there. With respect to the, the rhinos, um, and we have data, comparable data for all three islands, but just to keep things simpler, um, I'm going to focus on Protection Island today. So here are three metrics that we, that we collect every year. Burrow occupancy, which again is a measure of the proportion of burrows that are used by breeding pairs, hatching success, and fledging success. And we have data from a scientist who actually was the refuge manager for a number of years. We have data from the 70s, and so we can actually ask questions about, are, is there a suggestion that conditions have changed for this population over time? Um, and Protection Island being right on the boundary of Puget Sound and then the eastern edge of the Strait of Juan de Fuca, these birds are accessing areas that many people say, you know, this is a, an ecosystem that has been significantly degraded over time. Are the birds responding to that? Are they reflecting this putative degradation in the system through overfishing, through a variety of anthropogenic impacts? And you can see, and I'm not even going to you know, insult you by talking about the analyses, that you know, over the past four, nearly 40 years, in none of these reproductive metrics or parameters is there any suggestion that conditions have declined. If we look at diet, diet has also remained remarkably constant over that period of time. So no changes in reproductive success parameters whatsoever from the 70s um, up through today. The refuge also came to us and said, well, you know, we, we like what you're doing with the, the breeding, but we would also really like to get a sense of how large the population is and would you develop a protocol that is a bit more quantitative that we can actually meaningfully replicate in future years and compare in a statistically ro robust way? So we, there were a number of, of surveys done um, using a variety of methodologies, but you'll notice that none of them are bounded by confidence intervals. So there's really no way to say whether this number does differ from this number because we don't know what the confidence interval is. Um, the conventional thinking had been that this population has dec had declined, and in fact, this paper here by Wilson in 2005 said that there's actually been a very strong decline in the population. Our data actually suggests the opposite, and these data also <coughs> indicate that this is the third largest breeding colony for the species in North America. It's in the top five in the world, and it actually suggests that the population is not only declining, but it's actually increased. The degree to which it's increased is hard to say because the methodologies are not really uh, comparable. So we don't know how they derive their estimates. One more thing about the, the rhinoceros octets. Um, this is a project that a student of mine, Brittany Balbag, completed uh, two summers ago for her senior thesis. Um, the refuge was also really interested in understanding the impacts of black-tailed deer. This is a study that was it's quite parallel to the work on the, the cattle impacts on pink-footed shearwaters. So Brittany spent her summer, most of her summer working on Protection Island, um, beginning to address this question. And her results showed that 85% of these randomly placed study plots throughout the breeding colonies contained damaged burrows. Of those, 66% of the plots had burrows with structural damage, meant that it wasn't just the entrance that had been damaged by a deer stepping in it, but that the tunnel and or the nesting chamber had been compromised or absolutely destroyed. The median percentage of burrows with structural damage was 7%, but it was actually highly variable. So it ranged from 0% in some plots all the way up to 50%. Um, and that Part of what Brittany was doing was trying to characterize that. Are there certain parts of the island or certain types of colonies that were disproportionately susceptible to that? And so using that information, you know, Brittany wrote her thesis. Uh, we submitted a report to the, to the refuge. 
And that information was incorporated <coughs> into the Comprehensive Conservation Plan for Protection Island. And in fact, the refuge now is recommending that deer, for a variety of reasons, one of which is that it was set up as a seabird sanctuary, um, that deer be removed from the island. And just to wrap up, um, this is work that I, and I mentioned in my initial comments. We're just starting on. Uh, we're collaborating with uh, the Slater Museum on this. There are a couple of students already working on, on projects related to it. But the northern fulmar, which is a type of petrel, it's over on the upper right. It's actually a species that's um, been adopted by a number of researchers, um, both in Europe and down in California, as a biological indicator. They're very opportunistic foragers, and they will forage on, not, you know, they mistakenly identify plastic as, as food, they eat it, and they retain it in their di digestive tract. So they actually are, in a sad way, in a very effective sampler of the ubiquity and the density and abundance of plastics in the marine environment. Um, so what we're doing is using stomach samples these are birds that are donated to, to, the, to the university from a rehab center on the outer coast of Oregon. So birds come in either dead or they die um, in the rehab center and we receive the birds. It's this wonderful opportunity to use an unfortunate situation and learn something from them. And this is a complement to ongoing monitoring programs in California and Alaska on this species. Something that's been less well looked at is how ubiquitous is this issue across seabirds? So is this something that's kind of unusual to petrels and albatrosses where it's been well documented? Or is it broader than that? Are we seeing this in species that uh, we just haven't looked enough and, and it's there and it's a problem, but it's just for lack of having looked that we, we assume it isn't. So that's something that, again, because we're getting this really broad suite of species coming in, we can opportunistically use those individuals to <coughs> ask these questions about how, how broad is this impact and issue. So in the lower right, this is uh, a sample from a, the stomach of a single uh, northern fulmar. Um, and that's actually not all, that's a fairly common one. Um, it's, we're finding about 90 or 95 percent of the birds have, have plastic in their guts. And we're interested in characterizing the type of plastic ingest, ingested. Well, just to wrap up, a couple, a few take-home messages. Um, islands, I think, you know, they're compelling from a, in an absolute sense from a conservation perspective um, because of their inherent vulnerability, high levels of endemism, but they can, you can think of them as model systems for conservation. Um, they also tend to be, you know, compared to continental land masses, relatively small. And therefore, that smaller scale makes them more tractable, more realistic when we're talking about ambitious conservation actions. So you're more likely to have success with a conservation action on the scale of an island than you are on a continental scale. The second point is obviously nothing novel. Anybody who's really thought about conservation for any time will certainly agree with that. Conservation issues, although you can look at them from a research and a biological perspective, are ultimately human issues. And as such, the practice of conservation, the implementation of it, is really dependent on an interdisciplinary and an integrative approach. And I hope that I've demonstrated at least a little bit of that uh, philosophy through the work that we've been doing um, in, in uh, Juan Fernandez to a lesser extent here. Um, and that results require time and patience. And we've been working in Juan Fernandez for 11 <coughs> years now. We couldn't have done what we're doing now. We couldn't have gone in and said, we're going to implement this. We want to hire, we want to hire islanders and we want technicians. It, it, revol you know, it revolves around building credibility, trust, engaging with the local community, um, respecting what those local cultures value and working within those cultural norms. All of that is fundamental. The degree to which we've been successful in Chile is, is largely to do to that perseverance, patience, and a desire to work with the community. Um, that leads to the second point, commitment. You know, these are not easy things. They're not short-term solutions. 
And I've alluded to this already, the, the fundamental importance of community. If we really want to think about something lasting in Juan Fernandez, um, especially, those of the islands that we're working on right now, those are the only ones that are inhabited. The ones here in Washington are, are uninhabited. But you know, in, when we talk about conserving islands that have human populations, and arguably, whenever we talk about conservation in an area that has human populations, you cannot seriously talk about conservation unless you explicitly and actively engage the community. Um, it's absolutely fundamental. And so with that, and I don't expect you to read these, but this is just to reinforce the notion that uh, this is highly collaborative work. Uh, over here are, co this list is colleagues in Chile, or colleagues that I've worked with, uh, that I've worked with in Chile. These are students and technicians. Um, you'll see Chileans, you'll see Gringo names here in Washington, uh, colleagues, and then um, and technicians and or students. So the asterisks represent students. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have.